Howdy. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of President and Mrs. Bush, it's my great honor to welcome you to the annual Tawana Powell Lecture Series featuring former Prime Minister of Australia, John Howard. I'm delighted to welcome uh, Mr. Howard and his lovely wife, Jeanette, here to the Bush Library Center today. Before we start uh, tonight's program, I'd like to make a few acknowledgements and announcements. Uh, tonight's program is made possible through the generous support of Don Tawana Powell. They've been friends of the Bush Library Center for years. They've always been interested in our activities and have been generous in terms of their support of our activities. And I'm glad that they could be here tonight. Don Tawana, thank you very much. Uh, tonight also I love, I'd like to acknowledge the Alcoa Corporation. Uh, Alcoa is sponsoring a reception following the event tonight in the lobby in honor of the Prime Minister. So all of you are welcome to join us for that reception immediately following the presentation by the Prime Minister. Representing Alcoa tonight are Roy Toth and his lovely wife Renee. Roy, Renee, thank you. The Prime Minister will speak for approximately 25 to 30 minutes, and he's decided that it would be time to take some questions after that. So those of you who would like to pose a question to the Prime Minister, please feel free to do so. I see we've pre-positioned microphones, so you can make use of those microphones uh, when you pose your questions. At this time, ladies and gentlemen, it is my great pleasure to uh, call upon our host for this evening. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in a warm welcome for the 41st President of the United States, George Bush. Thank you all. Well, thank you all for coming, and it is a distinct privilege to welcome a friend, a good friend for the Bush family, starting with the current president and also Barbara and May uh, and his wife uh, here at A&M, and he's a world leader. And I don't think the United States ever had a better friend in office uh, than our speaker tonight. Uh, it speaks to the obvious that we live in a world of immense challenges, and few problems are greater than the threat of international terror, which seeks to destroy the institutions, the freedoms, and the openness that mark all civilized societies. I've long thought that the two greatest threats that we have faced in the post-Cold War world are instability and unpredictability. And in such a world, few leaders and nations have been greater allies in the cause of peace and prosperity than our speaker this evening. These days, since I'm frequently referred to as 41, you know, I used to be George Bush, now I'm either George H.W. Bush. Now I'm George H.W. Bush number 41, or George Bush 40. It's not fair. But anyway, I could just as easily refer to John Howard as 25. But, but out of respect, I think I'll refer to him as one of the best friends, the very best friends, and a wonderful guy as well, the very best friends the United States of America has ever had in office, uh, over the, certainly over the last 12 years and even before. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my honor to present to Texas A&M the Right Honorable John Howard. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. President, uh, Mrs. Barbara Bush, other distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. I want to thank my friend uh, George Bush, the 41st President of the United States, <laughs> and somebody who has visited Australia in his various iterations on at least five or six occasions, and somebody who won the affection and regard of the Australian people on each of those visits. I come here today as a very privileged guest of this university and this institution. Jeanette and I have had an opportunity of looking over the library 
that we're mightily impressed and we're greatly reminded because so many of the momentous political events of the last 30 years which have affected the lives of all of us in so many ways of course were events that involved the 41st President at their very centre. History rightly records that the most momentous political event of our lifetime was of course the implosion of the Soviet Union and history properly uh, attributes to the 40th President of the United States, Ronald Reagan, a major role in bringing about that event. But history also properly recognises the contribution of the 41st President, George Bush, through his skilful non-triumphalist diplomacy of consolidating the gains of that momentous event because it was in his presidency that the Berlin Wall came down and it was in his presidency that the Soviet Union finally disintegrated. And without the tact and skill and leadership that he applied to those events and to those times, the permanent benefit of the end of the Cold War and the disappearance of the Soviet Empire would not have been achieved. When somebody looks at the life and times of the person after whom this library is named, you are struck by an extraordinary life of public service. I think often of the President as being an exemplar of what is meant by the concept of public service. Somebody who has served in so many different positions including the highest position in his own country and the most powerful office in the free world. Somebody who contributed so much to his nation at such a young age in war. Somebody who built a reputation in his various roles as a person whose innate humanity and friendly personality uh, were a hallmark of his work as a political figure uh, and as a leader. I haven't forgotten that on the first occasion, and, and uh, Barbara exhorted me not to remind her of it, but on the, fir- the last occasion that the President and I were together in Australia, um, or the second last occasion, it was during... Uh, the President's Cup golf tournament between Australia and the United States. I pass over the outcome uh, of that particular event. But I do remember that both of us had one thing in common as uh, we walked around the golf course and we both marvelled at how slow Mark O'Meara's swing was and uh, uh, I just wondered if I could ever emulate that and perhaps reduce my golf handicap. President Bush was the very first leader of, and I was about to say foreign country, but I always find it rather difficult to use the adjective foreign when I'm talking about the United States. But he was the first leader of another country to address a joint sitting of our parliament early in 1992. And I've often wondered what it is that brings Americans and Australians together so much. I've often wondered why it is that Americans and Australians feel very comfortable with each other. It obviously has something to do with the fact that both of us are people who live in very large countries geographically. The United States is a little larger than Australia but the two nations are comparable although our populations are. The population of Australia is, what, three or four million shy of the population of Texas. <coughs> we have a lot in common when it comes to our love of sport, although for the mass spectator and mass participation sports, we have struggled manfully and failed completely to persuade Americans to develop a passion for cricket. And uh, 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 equally, um, I don't 
think that American football is going to replace rugby or Australian rules uh, in the affections uh, of Australians. I know from time to time we refurbish uh, Hollywood with quite a number uh, of talented Australian actors and actresses, but really what it all boils down to is that what unites us more than anything else and what makes us feel so much at ease with each other uh, are the values that we share in common. And it's always good on an occasion like this to remind ourselves of some of the fundamentals, the fundamentals of life politically and democratically. In the last 100 years, there have been fewer than 10 nations in the world that have been continuously democratic throughout that period. When you think of the large number of countries that now are democratic and you think of the democratic reach of the freedoms reach in 2008, but if you look back over the last 100 years, there have been fewer than 10 nations that have been continuously democratic. Now, some of those interruptions, of course, were through no fault of individual countries because they were invaded and occupied. But it doesn't alter the picture. And two of those countries, of course, have been the United States of America and Australia. And we share that great democratic tradition and experience in common. But there are other values that bring us together and make us feel comfortable and at ease with each other. And I think they are really the values that go to the human personality and to the individual. And belief in personal and economic freedom. And the belief that the worth of an individual is determined by his or her character and hard work and not by class or race or social background that the most important institution in our national life is the family. And can I say that there is no greater example of a wonderful family in the public gaze than the Bush family. I had the opportunity along with my wife and some other members of our family of, of, of dining as guests of the President and Mrs Bush at the White House the week before last. And there is a family that is very united, a family that is part of a broader loving family environment and it's a great example uh, to the American people. And the importance of family life in, in the activities of this nation and in the activities of my own nation uh, puts it right at the centre of what it is to be an Australian uh, or to be an American. We of course hold very dear to the principles of political freedom and political liberty. Australia is the only nation in the world that has fought beside the United States in every major conflict in which your country has been involved since World War I. And we have done that because it has been the right thing to do. We have done that because we believe that the values for which our countries have fought and the values for which the men and women of our armed forces have made in too many cases the supreme sacrifice are values that are worth preserving. It's impossible for me to speak to you as a former Prime Minister of Australia and someone who took the decision five years ago to commit the armed forces of my country uh, in coalition with the armed forces of the United States and Great Britain to the invasion of Iraq. It is impossible for me not to mention that in my remarks. I want to say that I greatly admired the courage and determination of President Bush when 14 months ago he decided to commit this country to the surge in Iraq. He did so against the advice of so many people but he did so, in my view, with a correct appreciation of what was involved. 
And although the battle is far from over, indeed it will have a long way to go yet and there will be some more wrong turns and there will be further setbacks. But inexorably, I believe the tide is turning and that the wisdom of the President's decision at the beginning of last year will, as time go by, goes by, be vindicated. And I certainly stand very strongly by the decision that my government took in 2003. I believe it was right. I believe that if the coalition were to leave Iraq in circumstances of defeat, it would do incalculable damage to the prestige of the West and the prestige of the United States in that part of the world. It would destabilise other nations in that part of the world with a friendly disposition towards the United States and the cause of the West and it would render even more distantly into the future the prospect, however hard it is, to achieve a lasting settlement between the Palestinians and the Israelis on the basis of a two-state solution whereby each should have their own nation and each should be entitled to live in peace without molestation behind secure and internationally recognised borders. It is important when we think of Iraq and we think of Afghanistan to understand the nature of this new threat. It is a different war from wars in which our nations have been involved in the past. It does not involve declarations, it does not involve ultimatums, it does not involve armies rolling across borders. It involves an assault in a different way on the values of our societies and the things that we hold dear. And nobody should imagine for a moment that the key objective of Islamic fascism, because that is what we're dealing with, the key objective of Islamic fascism is over time and through a process of attrition and they have limitless patience and a limitless determination to test our patience and to test our resolve. Nobody should imagine for a moment that the ultimate goal isn't to persuade sufficient people within our own nations that the struggle is not worth it, that in the long run maybe some kind of accommodation and some kind of understanding, some kind of uh, federated settlement between different ways of life is the solution. Because the Islamic fascists suspect rightly I'm sorry to say that there is within all of our societies an element of self-doubt, a belief that maybe it was all something that we may have done in the past that brought it about. And one of the greatest challenges our societies have is to preserve a sense of cultural self-belief and understanding that there is nothing fundamentally wrong with our culture and our belief system because it's a culture and a belief system that is built upon respect for individuals. It's built upon a belief that if all the peoples of the world are given an opportunity of savouring democracy, then those people uh, will embrace democracy and enjoy the benefits and the fruits of democracy. As the President said in his very kind words of introduction, it is stating the obvious to say that we are living in very difficult times. We're living at a time when your country continues to make very big sacrifices of lives and of treasure, leading the fight against terrorism and leading the fight in support of the way of life in which we believe. 
It's a leadership role that by dint of America's size and power uh, falls to her very heavy responsibility. But it's a leadership role that has not meant your country is alone. My host today, the 41st President, demonstrated when he assembled that great coalition in 1991 what real leadership was about and his skill in assembling that coalition that won the respect of the participants and won the respect of the world. We will win this fight against terrorism but it will take a long time. It will take unity, it will take solidarity, it will take patience and it will take resilience and it will take an understanding that those who we oppose are prepared to play an endless waiting game. Terrorists of the type we now face are an enemy we haven't faced before. They have no regard for the lives of any of those who they seek to kill or cripple and equally many of them have no regard for their own lives which is for many of us a new experience in relation to dealing with an enemy. But in the end what we are fighting for uh, is the preservation of a way of life, a way of life that we all as Americans and Australians understand, a way of life that respects the individual that wants to create a society where every child, irrespective of his or her background or colour or race or religion, has an opportunity of succeeding in life. I'm constantly amazed whenever I come to the United States of the reminder of what this country represents by way of encouraging individual initiative and personal liberty and personal freedom. Can I say to you as a friend uh, and a visitor and a very happy visitor that uh, I remain as my wife does and uh, my other members of my family who have visited this country do that um, your, your zest for individual freedom, your uh, zest for free enterprise, for competitive capitalism if I can put it that way uh, remains not only highly impressive but completely undiminished. America and other parts of the world face some economic challenges at the present time. Those economic challenges will be overcome and dealt with through the application of the same economic policies that you have pursued in the past which are posited on a belief in economic freedom, in economic orthodoxy, in not resorting to protectionism, not resorting to over-regulation and always remembering that governments have no money of their own, presidents and prime ministers have no money of their own apart from their modest salaries. The only money they have is the money that is contributed by taxpayers. And whenever I hear a Member of Parliament or a a member of Congress or a President or a Prime Minister uh, talking about our money or the government's money and I used to do it and I used to make the same mistake myself and my colleagues did when I was in government. I'd always remind them and remind myself that it's not our money, it belongs to the taxpayers and if there's any left over after you've expended it on all the necessaries of running the government, the taxpayers are always very keen to have it back and uh, I think they're entitled to because they're the ones that have worked hard and they're the ones that have contributed. Can I just finally say that um, it is a real pleasure for Jeanette and for me uh, to be here at the Bush Library, to be here in Texas. Um, our two countries um, have had a lot to do with each other over a very long period of time. It's been my privilege as uh, Prime Minister of Australia, it was my privilege for almost 12 years as Prime Minister of Australia. Uh, I interacted, uh, of course, with the current President uh, from the time that he took office in early in 2001. I had, in fact, 
met him for the very first time in the Oval Office on the 10th of September 2001 and I was in Washington uh, on the 11th of September. And we have become very close over that period of time and I respect and admire his tenacity and strength very greatly. I had the privilege of leading the... Fo- I had the privilege of meeting the uh, 41st President for the very first time uh, way back in 1982 when he and his wife represented the United States at the commemoration of the Battle of the Coral Sea in World War II, which is fondly remembered uh, by Australia as a moment when American military power prevented a potential invasion of Australia by the Japanese. And I remember his great courtesy and civility then and that of his wife. And again, as leader of the opposition, I met him in Washington in 1986. On every occasion, he's impressed me as a man of not only great civility and charm, but also one who contributes and adds value to the relationship between our two societies. And to be reminded as we walk through the library today of the great career of the 41st President. And it was a a panorama of the great political events that have influenced my lifetime and influenced the lifetimes of so many people in this room. But at the end of the day, the thing that has always impressed me most about him and the thing that is really at the kernel of the relationship between our two countries are the values that our peoples hold in common. Because there's something permanent and there's something um, uh, constant about values. You can change presidents, you can change prime ministers, you can change governments. And in a democracy, that inevitably happens. But what you can't change uh, are the, the values of nations. And what first appeals about Americans to Australians and vice versa are still the things that appeal uh, about our two societies to each other and that is the values that we hold in common. Those values are involved in all the great confrontations in which our nations are involved at the present time and they are the values that will always keep our people close and friendly and will always make Australians and Americans the most natural and relaxed, a very good friend. Thank you. I'd like to thank the Prime Minister for those supportive yet thought-provoking remarks. And now we have time for a few questions. Um, those of you who would like to pose a question can use the microphones that are prepositioned in the aisles. It always takes a while to get the first one going. I see a lot of students here. Yes. Thank you, sir, for your time here. I'm a senior finance student. Um, my name is Caleb Peter Hobart. Uh, I was wondering what advice or counsel do you have to, um, for us students who are about to conquer the world? <laughs> you are about to? <laughs> the, the students that are here today. The students? Students. Yeah, sorry, sorry. Um, so, first of all, an observation. Uh, and secondly, some advice. Uh, the observation is that you are a very fortunate generation. Uh, you've been born into a world uh, which for all of its problems uh, is an easier world than the generation that um, was born into the 1920s and the 1930s. Um, arguably because the threat of nuclear annihilation has been removed because in my view of the, of the good work of the 40th and 41st Presidents of the United States 
uh, their, their leadership, that's been removed. And um, economic times are better than they were in the 1970s, although the 1950s and 60s were periods of great stability and prosperity in the United States and in Australia. But I think you're, you know, and, and of course the other great thing you have is that you know, life expectancy now, in the information technology and communicate. I mean, you can travel the world, your children can travel the world now and you don't feel as out of touch with them. I often tell the story that when I was in my 20s, I, I, I went and lived in London for a year and I travelled around Europe and I wrote to my mother every, every fortnight and she wrote me every fortnight and I rang her once in the year that I was away and I reversed the charges. And, um, well, well, I was broke and... Uh, uh, she expected me to reverse the charges. But I compare that with the contact we have with our own children when they travel around and you speak to them three or four times a week and email them. It's a different world, it's terrific. Uh, now that's the, that's, that's the observation. The advice, well the advice is, is probably the same sort of advice that, uh, that uh, uh, both my age would have, would have given to fellows your age um, 40 or 50 years ago, and that is that you shouldn't take any of this good fortune for granted, uh, that you do have to work very hard. I hope that Americans of your generation, as I hope Australians of my generation, will, will embrace totally globalisation. I do hope as worry about economic conditions comes to a number of countries, including the United States, there is no return to protectionism. And I hear some talk about the North American Free Trade Agreement. I, I think, I mean, I'm sorry, I, I'd be great pity if people started thinking about renegotiating something that was meant to free trade between nations. I actually would like to see uh, even freer trade I would like to see the Doha free trade round succeed and I think that would be very valuable for developing countries, more valuable than foreign aid. I don't want to see any, any return to protectionism and I hope all the students here who are going to go into business or finance or economics or politics or whatever uh, will uh, you know, embrace that as a credo. I think it would be a terrible mistake um, if we did that. But all the sort of advice that was given 40 years ago to Sam say you don't take it for granted, you work hard um, and you keep to the free enterprise space that has made this country great and prosperous. I mean the thing that has made America great and strong economically is its undiluted belief in free enterprise and it always operates best when it sticks to that. It always gets into a spot of bother when it deviates from it. Sir, would you um, give us your assessment looking in the rearview mirror of the uh, changes you made to the Australian tax system? Yes, I'm very happy to do that. Um, uh, we did make some changes to the Australian tax system. The biggest change we made uh, was um, that we introduced at a national level a broad-based value added or broad-based consumption tax called the goods and services tax. Unlike America, we don't have retail taxes at a state level. We have a federal income tax and uh, we used to have a very clunky, old-fashioned wholesale sales tax. We got rid of that and we brought in a uniform goods and services tax and contemporaneously we lowered personal income tax and we also reduced corporate tax. Australia doesn't have any death duties of any kind. We have no probate or succession duties um, and we don't have a uh, capital gains tax uh, on the family home, although we don't allow mortgage interest to be tax deductible. Uh, I don't want to bore you with a long technical comparison of the American and Australian tax systems, but whenever you answer a question on tax in another country, you've got to try and uh, put it in the context, otherwise people say, well that's horrific or, or that's absolutely awful um, without sort of knowing the context. But the big change we made uh, was to reduce the um, personal income tax and corporate tax and to introduce a broad-based indirect tax 
at a level of some 10%. And um, it's worked very well. It's made our exports more competitive. It, it has helped our manufacturing industry because the old wholesale sales tax, which was at a fairly high level, did not in any way capture our service industries, which were the fastest growing part of our economy. And they placed, in the nature of being a wholesale sales tax, they placed quite a heavy burden on our manufacturing industry. And uh, I think it has worked um, effectively. Uh, there's no tax system in the world that is, is, is ideal and is without a lot of wrinkles. Um, I think it is quite a good system and uh, it's one of the major reforms that our government was able to implement. This young lady. Okay, um, let me first just say that it's quite an honour to be addressing you here today as you are the subject of my senior thesis. Um, actually. <laughs> But um, I guess for my question, um, I've done a lot of research about what others have said to be your crowning achievements during your 33 years in political power. And I guess I'd just like to know what you would say is one of your proudest moments during your time in power. Well, this is a very interesting place in the world in which to say it, but I'll nonetheless say it. One of my greatest achievements was to, uh, I believe, not the greatest, but one of them early in my term as Prime Minister was to introduce some um, national gun control laws um, uh, in Australia. <laughs> uh, uh, well, you asked me. It's a democracy. <laughs> we had a massacre at a little place called Port Arthur in Tasmania and 35 people were killed by a madman with a semi-automatic weapon and we introduced Now that was... That, there's a different context, there's a different culture in relation to that and I'll just press my case. Um, um, I think though, as Prime Minister, I'm, I'm very proud of the fact that we more than halved the unemployment rate in the time that I was in government. Politicians talk a lot about um, economic policy and they say, you know, this is good economic policy or bad economic policy. In the end, um, what matters is the human dividend. I mean, if, 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 it, if an economic policy doesn't make lives happier and better for people, then it's a bad policy. I mean, you, you, you can't judge economic policy by uh, some kind of abstract measure. And sometimes when I listen to economists, sometimes when I read the financial pages of newspapers, be it, whether it's in America, Australia or Britain or elsewhere, you, you sometimes lose sight of it. Uh, 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 people they can't see the wood for the trees. So um, I was very proud of that. Uh, I was also proud in the in the foreign policy area of the fact that we were able to simultaneously develop an even closer relationship with the United States. We've always been close, but I think during my time as Prime Minister, the two countries got closer. Our intelligence sharing arrangements were even more intense. We negotiated a free trade agreement. It's the first time America's part of NAFTA, uh, which involves Canada, has uh, negotiated a free trade agreement with uh, a highly developed country. And um, in so many other ways we became very close. But at the same time, I was able to build a very good relationship with China uh, Australia, as you may know, exports a lot to China. Uh, China is very hungry for our iron ore, for our natural gas, <coughs> for our coal, and um, we have a very strong trade relationship with China. And some of my critics said that when I became Prime Minister, the Asian leaders wouldn't deal with me, wouldn't talk to me. I know political opponents are prone to say exaggerated things about uh, each other in, in, in election campaigns, but I was very proud that we were able to build uh, that relationship and I made it very clear to the Chinese that our relationship with the United States was built on the sort of values I was talking about and was built on and I, was, I was reminded of how values are important when in 2003 we had a very rare moment in Australian history um, the current president of your country was in Canberra the day before 
a visit to Canberra by President Hu Jintao of China and I had invited President Bush to address, as his father had done, a joint sitting of the Australian Parliament. And he knew in advance that he'd been invited and I saw him at a meeting at the ATEC countries in Bangkok a couple of weeks earlier and he said, John, are there going to be any hecklers or any interjections? And I said, yes, George, there will be. Uh, I said, there's one member of the parliament, he's a green senator and his name's Brown, and uh, <laughs> uh, I said, he will interject, or he will kick up a fuss. And he said, okay, that's fine. The next, you know, sure enough, the president addresses the joint city and Brown interjects and the president gives him a wonderful response which gets a huge round of applause and hands the thing with great flair. The president of China was due to address the gathering the very next day, same joint city, and the Chinese delegation was very nervous that there would be an interjection. And they were saying to my staff, is there any way we can stop an interjection? I said, no, this is a democracy. You can't stop interjection. I said, what has to happen is that, you know, you just have to deal with the interjection the way President Bush dealt with the interjection. That's what you do in our sort of society and I don't think our friends were sort of very comforted by that at one stage there was some thought that maybe his address wouldn't go ahead. I mean, the point I make is that, is, is, is that the mindset in relation uh, to uh, those sorts of things is so very different in a totalitarian country from a democracy. And I say that to somebody who's very proud of the relationship that I built with China. It's a very valuable relationship for Australia. But it's a different relationship and will always be different from the one we have in America because we don't have the same common values. And that's why values are more important than anything else in looking at the relationship between countries. Yes, sir. You've spoken very eloquently about the importance of the shared values and the preservation of culture. I wonder if you could comment about the importance of language in that. As I recall, my last trip to Melbourne, somewhat before your tenure, the public restroom signs were in English, Greek, and Italian. Well, they're probably a bit out of date now because the last survey indicated that the most widely spoken foreign language in Australia now is a combination of Cantonese and Mandarin. Uh, that uh, They have replaced um, Greek and Italian because the Greek and Italian populations um, they are of an older immigrant group and of course the second generation in most cases now um, uh, have merged into the general population, they speak their language less frequently. We do have foreign language signs. Um, I mean, I, um, I, I have a very simple view about this. Um, a, a nation like America and Australia can only have one uh, national language. And, um, <clears throat> and, I, and, and the people who are most disadvantaged by there not being a full comprehension of the national language are the people who don't speak it. I mean, we have Indigenous Australians, Aboriginal Australians in some part of the Northern Territory who don't have proficiency in English. Now, I have absolutely no concern about those Australians having a proficiency in their own tribal language, none at all. But I do think it's a terrible burden for them and a terrible failure of our education system that they are not fluent in English because that is our national language. And the people who are going to suffer most from that are them. Now, the same thing applies, if I may say so, to any other country. I don't think people should be... If people wish to converse in their mother tongue, if I can use that expression, in their own homes or even outside their own homes in public. That's entirely a matter for them and I have no objection at all to that. But I think if we ever have a language policy that in effect encourages neglect of the common language of the nation, 
we are doing a disservice to the people who are so discouraged. <laughs> Mr. Prime Minister, this will be our last question, sir. Yeah, good afternoon, Mr. Howard. Uh, you spoke a lot tonight about the, uh, the common values of USA <coughs> and Australia and how we share close ties. How do you feel this will change now that the Rudd government's in power? Look, um, the relationship between Australia and America um, has been a relationship that has endured irrespective of different governments uh, being in office. The 41st President of the United States uh, while um, he was in office, he dealt entirely with Labor governments. He had a very good relationship with Bob Hawke, who was the uh, Prime Minister of Australia for most of the time uh, that um, he was President. For the first three or four years that I was Prime Minister, President Clinton uh, was in the White House. Uh, I have, as you know, developed a very close relationship with your current President. And I'm very proud of that and it's a relationship of, of mutual respect. And I think that has brought some extra dimensions to the relationship. But belief in the American alliance is, is a bipartisan constant in Australian politics. Um, during World War II, um, you had President Roosevelt and uh, Prime Minister John Curtin, who was the Labor Prime Minister. The ANZUS Treaty was signed in 1951 when Sir Robert Menzies, Australia's longest serving Prime Minister and um, the person who founded my, my party, the Liberal Party, and for American audiences, Liberal in Australia means slightly different uh, <laughs> uh, uh, from uh, what it does here, but uh, you know, I should perhaps have a glossary of terms behind me just to sort of explain it. Um, uh, so, my, my answer is that it's a bipartisan view. Now, clearly every government has three different policies and different policy dimensions but Mr Rudd um, is committed to the American alliance, he said that and I have no reason for a moment to doubt it and, and I would hope that under his Prime Ministership the relations between Australia and the United States remain very close. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes our program for tonight. I invite you to join us in the lobby for the reception. I ask, however, in the meantime, that the President's guests remain seated. And, of course, Mr. Prime Minister, thank you very much for being with us tonight and making this evening such a success. Thank you.